Welcome to this presentation about generating art with artificial intelligence. Thanks, Professor Andy Wei uh, from uh, Dublin City University for inviting me. My name is Arturo Calvo. I'm a computer scientist based in Norway. I have to say that I don't have any formal data science education. Uh, in fact, I think the first time I heard the term machine learning was in 2014 when I started working at the ADAPT Center in, in Dublin with uh, Professor Andy Wei. Uh, where I had the opportunity to learn from the world-class experts. Many of them were based in uh, VCU, I was based in Trinity. Uh, and within just a few months, I became very, very passionate about the topic. Uh, I even uh, co-founded the uh, popular meetup group called Machine Learning Dublin that I heard it has now over 6,500 members, which is quite impressive. And uh, I'm currently working in uh, Accenture in uh, Norway as head of uh, digital product creation. I'm also the founder of AIMade.art, which is an online gallery of art generated by AI. That is the topic I would like to talk to you about today. So I, I moved to Norway in uh, 2017. I'm neither Irish nor Norwegian, as you can guess from my accent, I'm from Spain. And some months later, I bought this tiny apartment in Oslo. Uh, I took this photo shortly after moving. You can appreciate that I spent quite some time mounting uh, IKEA furniture. As you can see, the apartment was so empty, right? Uh, I didn't have anything on the walls. I didn't even have curtains, almost empty bookshelves. And since I always loved art, I grew up with uh, art in Spain. I decided to buy some nice paintings to decorate the walls of the apartment. So I went to uh, quite a few galleries in, in Oslo with my almost inexistent budget. And wow, Norway is a very expensive country. I thought that Dublin was expensive. You cannot imagine Oslo. So I really literally couldn't afford any of that. So I came back home uh, disappointed. I even tried to find uh, cheaper alternatives online, but I couldn't find anything fitted my budget. So I said to myself, well, uh, if I cannot afford buying wall art, I will need to create my own. And no, I didn't sign up for <laughs> painting courses myself, but I started teaching a machine to create art for me. I had some previous experience uh, generating music with uh, AI, uh, with, uh, with uh, Magenta from uh, Google Brain when I was working in uh, Accenture in Dublin. But uh, these techniques have boosted in the last few years, especially thanks to an American researcher called Ian Goodfellow that in 2014 published a paper Generative Adversarial Networks. GAN for short, that have revolutionized the creative industry. The main concept behind generative models in general is that given a training dataset of, for example, the Francisco de Goya portrait paintings that you can visit at Museo del Prado in Madrid that we have on the left, we can infer the probability distribution that generated them and then try to generate new samples for that distribution, which are the samples on the right that never existed before are uh, generated by uh, artificial intelligence. Let me briefly explain the architecture of GANs. There are two convolutional ne neural networks that compete with each other. Uh, we have the discriminator and the generator. The discriminator is fed sometimes with samples from the training dataset, which are real images, and other times with the output from the generator, which are fake images. And its job, the job of the discriminator, is to distinguish the real from the fake ones. The generator takes as input the latent space, which is um, a representation of the features that we have managed to encode and some random noise in order to generate fake images which should be as good as possible so that the discriminator believes that they are real but they are fake. 
both uh, generator and discriminator receive feedback that helps tuning the, the model weights. So back to our paintings example, sometimes the discriminator is fed with samples from the training data set, which are the real oil paintings from human artists. And in this case, the discriminator wants D of X to be close to one, uh, which means that they are flagged as real images. And some other times, it's the generator who creates the painting that is passed to the discriminator. And in that case, the discriminator wants D of G of Z to be close to zero, which means that they are flagged as fake. While the generator wants D of G of Z to be close to one, which means that we are fooling the discriminator. So that's why they are called adversarial, because we have two networks that compete with each other. So in practice, this is unsupervised learning with the uh, inner loops of artificial supervised learning, because it's creating its own levels internally. It's using game theory, Minimax, where the discriminator and the generator are the two players that take turns with simultaneous updates of the model weights. Uh, so the, the goal is to minimize the maximum loss for the worst case, so that the generator seeks to minimize the log of the inverse probability for fake images, which encourages the generator to create samples that have low probability to be flagged as fake, if that makes sense. While the discriminator seeks to maximize the average of the log probability for real images and the log of the inverse probability for fake images. Then after each iteration, uh, the discriminator coaches the generator on ways to fully to better next time. Uh, so that both the generator and the discriminator get better over time. The model learns as well that there are uh, many correct answers, not only one. Well, this uh, approach presents many, many challenges, um, uh, such as uh, when the generator becomes too good too quickly, uh, which is like having your, your grandmother evaluating your paintings. Uh, that she would say, ah, everything is fantastic, everything is wonderful, which is somehow useless feedback. So that then the, the generator will exploit weaknesses of the discriminator consistently. And uh, there, there are different techniques to overcome this. Uh, one of them is just choosing some uh, optimal learning rates. And another one that is much more common is when the discriminator becomes too good too quickly, which is like having Picasso uh, evaluating the paintings of a three-year-old child, right? That uh, he would say, oh, what is this? Do you call this impressionism? Do it again. Uh, so the, the uh, generator becomes a bit frustrated, right? Um, the discriminator doesn't provide enough feedback uh, for the generator to, to make any progress at all. And there are different techniques that try to overcome this. It's not that easy. Uh, there are different modifications of, the, of uh, Minimax that can help um, or as well to skip updating the, the model weights uh, of the discriminator sometimes. And something that has worked for me sometimes uh, is uh, what we call the one side label smoothing that uh, it's instead of using one uh, as, as label for real images, uh, we use a random value between 0 0.7 and 1. And by doing that, we help reducing the overconfidence of the discriminator. Another challenge is what is called the mode collapse, um, 
which means that, well, we, we normally expect a wide variety of outputs, right? So basically a different painting for every random input, right? Uh, but if the generator produces some output that uh, gets good scores from the discriminator, it might eventually learn to produce only that output or a reduced set of outputs. The discriminator in normal circumstances should learn to reject those outputs, or, well, in this case, those inputs that are sent over and over again. But if the discriminator gets stuck in a local minimum, we will end up rotating through a small set of, uh, of outputs. Um, and uh, yeah, the, this problem, mode collapse, is uh, quite common and there are different techniques that uh, try to, to solve this or at least to alleviate this and, and the most common one is uh, using the, the Wars, uh, Wasserstein loss. Um, I recently heard as well about uh, another technique uh, that NVIDIA uh, published on, on a new paper uh, that is called implicit competitive regularization. That is uh, a new technique that tries to stabilize GANs uh, by... It makes the discriminator and the generator agree with each other uh, beforehand on how are they going uh, to update the, the model weights in each iteration. I briefly touched upon the concept of latent space, which is a representation of the compressed data, and it has a structure that can be explored. Uh, this, in theory, enables us to perform vector arithmetics between points in the latent space. I haven't experimented with that, but uh, in, in theory, uh, if we have, for example, the, the vector for man with glasses, and subtract the one for man without glasses and add the one for woman without glasses, we would get actually the representation of woman with glasses, which is quite cool. Since the original paper was published in 2014 by Ian Goodfellow, many others have followed and it's quite interesting to see the progress in the state of the art and very specially the improvement in the perceived quality when they are used for generating human faces that is uh, one of the common use cases for research. Um, one year later uh, this paper Dissigan uh, was published, uh, it became quite popular. It was using uh, transposed uh, convolutions to, to upscale the image resolution and in 2016, uh, Kogan was published as well. It was using two teams of uh, two generators and two discriminators that were sharing uh, the model weights between them. But in 2017, there was a huge jump in the perceived quality with the program paper, as you can see on the screen. Uh, and then 2018 is when uh, NVIDIA, they published the paper uh, StyleGAN. Uh, NVIDIA is one of the main players uh, in, in this research topic and they introduced the concept of uh, adaptive instance normalization, also known as ADAIN. Uh, the, the last paper of um, StyleGAN was published just a few months ago and it's, it's quite a scary. Um, I, I would say uh, when only a computer forensic could tell that none of these people actually exists. And we will talk a bit later about the, the ethical implications. When it comes to my project AIMA.art, what I did first was to uh, write some scripts to download public domain oil paintings with my desired characteristics. It's very important that they are public domain because that means that eventually I can use them for commercial purposes. So that's why I chose uh, paintings between the 15th and 19th centuries uh, that I downloaded from Metropolitan Museum of New York and uh, WikiArt. I was able to, to gather over 20,000 public domain paintings. 
uh, and with three different styles, uh, which are portrait, landscape, and abstract styles. I wanted to, uh, to build three different models. And I, I edited these uh, images. I wanted them to have a, a consistent format. So uh, I, I reformatted them to, to be square uh, with uh, 512 by 112 pixels. I flipped horizontally as well the, the portraits because in many cases the person is uh, looking to, to the left and I wanted to, to have a, a, a wider representation. Then I used a set of different uh, open source algorithms. I started with uh, DCGAN and after that uh, I was adding uh, some uh, new features uh, in order to st stabilize and get uh, better results. I was running the, the data set over the algorithm. Uh, in many cases, I had to stop, revert to a checkpoint of the, of the model, tune some uh, hyperparameters, the, the learning rate, uh, the smooth labeling, etc., and then continue. Um, so that's why it took me over 1200 hours per model, uh, which is uh, quite quite a lot uh, running on, on GPUs, on, on Google Cloud. Initially, I was using as well Google Colab, that is a great tool. Um, and if you ask me if uh, it should take less time, yes, it definitely should take a much le less time. But uh, in, in my case, I had to experiment quite a lot. Uh, the, the training uh, was not very stable and I had to, to experiment uh, and, and tune the, the hyperparameters and revert uh, to, to a previous stage. So uh, it was uh, quite an interesting learning experience. As well, I tried with different uh, data sets apart from uh, these three ones that I, I mentioned. Um, uh, for example, I, I wanted to, to try as well for a specific artist and I uh, got from the uh, Edward Munch Museum in, in Oslo as well that they have an open uh, API. Uh, I got the paintings, but I was able to to gather uh, very few of them. It's uh, very few, I mean, it's, it's just a few hundred. And I, I was hoping just to get some results with a Munch style, but uh, it didn't work out. It was uh, a complete uh, insult to, to the memory of the greatest artist in the history of Norway. So um, I, I learned as well that you really need a, a quite big number of of images in the training data set. So with a few hundreds, uh, it's unlikely to, to achieve anything that is worth uh, showing. And these are the results. These are 10 artworks that we exhibited in January 2020 at the Rework Deep Learning Conference in San Francisco. We have uh, portraits, Most of them are named in Spanish. Landscapes. And as well, uh, abstract art. But Wait a moment, I've been talking all this time about artworks, but is this really art? This is some of the feedback that I have received, arguing that it should not be considered art, which I totally respect, but what is actually art? According to the Cambridge Dictionary, art is the making of objects, images, music, etc. that are beautiful or that express feelings. So I believe that we are generating art in the sense that it can be beautiful and hopefully it makes the viewers feel some emotions. And even some authors argue that it expresses the feelings of the artists in the training dataset. So in, in my opinion, AI is pushing the boundaries of art exactly like photography did in its early years when it was banned from art exhibitions. Is this really art? Yes, absolutely, this is art. Perhaps not because it's, in my opinion, beautiful, but because it expresses feelings. Although you might think that is 
a bit overvalued. AI art is overvalued as well. On the left, you can see the first AI artwork that was sold in an auction. It was created by three French students that used the DCGAN open source algorithm that they found on GitHub and trained the model with some paintings they found online and sold it for almost half a million dollars in 2018. And you might be wondering, hey, so how does intellectual property fit here? Well, this expert summarizes it very well. It's a total legal mess because does the IP belong to the creators of the algorithms or does it belong to the original artists from the training dataset that in my case, all of them are dead centuries ago. But even in that case, how can you prove that the specific painting was part of the training data set because machine learning is a black box. Or does the IP belong to the machine as an entity? Because the US copyright law doesn't use the word human anywhere, which led to the interesting case of an animal rights organization taking a photographer to court for copyright infringement for this selfie because it was the monkey who actually pressed the button. What is a bit more clear, as I touched upon uh, a bit earlier, is that you cannot train a model with copyrighted images or music and then sell the output of the model. They need to be either public domain or you should own the copyright of uh, those uh, images in the training dataset. AI can generate other types of art, such as poetry. So who would you say is the author of this poem? Is it a hipster poet from London or a robot from Google AI? Well, I was asking this question in previous presentations and most of the people said, of course, a robot. Well, it's a hipster poet from London called Christopher Pike. But this one is actually generated by a robot with predictive text techniques using as seed a word I provided, which was serendipity, plus a selfie. So as it happens, uh, robot poetry is able to fool humans most of the time, according to researchers from uh, Microsoft and Kyoto University that run a sort of Turing test. I wonder if it's because robot poetry is becoming more human or is it human poetry becoming more robotic? We can as well generate music with AI, which is a growing market nowadays. Two useful resources are Magenta, which is an open source library that runs over TensorFlow that you can use in order to train your own models with music that you like, and then you can generate new songs with that style. As I said at the beginning of my presentation, I have some experience generating music with AI, and it was with uh, one of the early versions of Magenta, and I used it in order to generate video game music that was kind of fun. Another useful resource is MuseNet, that is a web app to generate your own music for free over some pre-trained models with different styles. As an example, I use MuseNet to generate this jazz song that uh, is using as input the first five notes from the Pink Panthers theme. And there are even movies already directed, written, and even performed by AI. This one is called Zone Out, and you can find it on YouTube. It's only six minutes long. Probably is not the best movie for a romantic evening with your partner, but it's kind of fun. And even the music is generated by AI. So let's watch uh, the, my favorite 40 seconds of the movie. How do you know what happens to that guy? I'm doing it for you. 
Are you sure you need a problem? I'm not certain. I don't remember the loss of a substance. You can't do that. We're gonna have a completely pressure tape. I think we're about to go to the ship. This is business. I'm here to help you in six months. I don't understand. That's enough. This is incredible. What do you mean? Perhaps something has been blocked off by the contagion. Why don't you tell me what you say is true that the human being will be able to reinforce the destruction of a human being? I'm on my way. Guns have unfortunately multiple malicious applications, such as automating the creation of fake social media accounts with profile pictures generated by guns that look incredibly realistic and they are used for scam. Fake news, the generation of deep fake videos that I recently read uh, that are banned in the US for political use 60 days before elections. Now it's easier than ever to produce fake or incriminating photographs and videos that only a specialized computer forensic can distinguish. And there is uh, even a trend in porn that is porn on demand synthesizing images of other people, normally celebrities, without their consent. And I read as well that 100% of the victims are women. These are just some examples of how an apparently harmless technique can be used for malicious purposes and impact humans and society as a whole. That is why it's so, so important to take ethics into consideration while developing AI solutions. On the bright side, guns have a huge potential to help humanity. One example I read recently is generating virtually unlimited sets of medical data that can be used for medical research with GANs while keeping patients' information private. Also, GANs are already enriching the creative industries with new products and new services that we could not even imagine just a few years ago, and I really can't wait to see what it will bring in the future. And when it comes to me, now I have six AI artworks uh, that give a classy style to my apartment. And uh, although framing them in Norway was uh, four times more expensive than actually producing the artworks, I can say mission accomplished. Thanks so much. Please uh, feel free to contact me by email or via Professor Andy Way. With any comments or any questions that you might have, I would be delighted to hear from you. Thank you.